Okay. I don't know what to do. Everyone who first calls me says I don't know what to do. And the magic here is you stay with the question. I just want to reassure you that there's an answer to it all if you stay with the question. So what you do, this, this, this is very important and it's so fundamental because your power is in staying with the question long enough until you get the answer instead of giving up. Most, I work mostly with women, that what the problem is n that they don't know what to do. The problem is they, I don't know what to do, and then they fly off to something else. Mm -hmm. Movies, vacation, mm -hmm. volunteering, work, children, there's thousands of distractions. Mm -hmm. Your ticket to freedom, this is the routine. You come back and you stay with the question long enough. This is the secret, yet. You don't know what to do yet. And then you turn to somebody that you trust and you ask them, what would you do if you were me? And you keep the dialogue alive. It's very important not to stay isolated in your circuitous thinking and come up and create a dialogue of discovery. And I promise you, you'll find an answer. The problem is not knowing, the problem is staying with the, not staying with the question long enough to find the answer. So remember the first session that we had? Fight, flight, or figure it out? Do you remember that? <coughs> fight, flight. This is very important. Flight, fright. There's actually another one here. This is freeze. When I work with people, we enter up here, and I get them to stay present enough. And you stay, and you slow down to be present, excuse me, to think, to be present, and then you, you have the decision, it goes right through here, and then you make a decision of what to do. Okay, but if you can't get through, if you can't slow down to think it through, I don't know what to do. You keep on going, and you'll come through this fight and flight. People are really afraid of not knowing the answer, especially if you think your neighbor's doing such a better job at this than you. Do you understand what I mean? They must know what they're doing. Their house is perfect, and they won't. <laughs> now, I, I work with highly functional women in reasonably lovely homes, you know, so their house is actually, you know, in reasonably good shape and the things piled up like inheritances and children and divorces and deaths and this stuff just came into their home and they have to figure it out and they don't want to. This is the resistance. So they reach a level of pain enough to ask for help and then I teach them a slower process of just thinking it through. But you got to slow down to think it through. The answers will come, put a comma on yet, engage with somebody and go, what would you do with, if you were me? Come up with three options and pick the one that's best for you. It works every time. After six weeks of working with her, once a week, three to four hours a week, she doesn't say this anymore to me. She doesn't go, I don't know what to do, or I don't know, and stop. She goes, well, I suppose we could do this or that, and maybe that. And even if none of the answers make sense, she's, creative, she's thinking creatively. She's engaged. This is what you need. You need to stay engaged. That. <laughs> This is a dynamic, creative process. And you stay engaged with the question. She's engaging with her stuff to decide whether it's clutter or not. It's the lack of engagement and the isolation that gets people into trouble. The shame, the embarrassment. So this woman was um, decluttering a, a 
an apartment that was in the house. Her mother had died uh, about four years earlier. And one of the reasons that was making it so hard is she was so annoyed at her mother for leaving all this stuff behind. And I went, oh, sweetie pie, you're actually in really good shape because you're lucky that she's in a one-bedroom apartment. She didn't leave you the big old house. She left you one. This is normal protocol. This is what happens. Somebody's, you know, the next generation takes care of it. I had to move her from victim to this is normal. She wasn't being put on, put out. Um, now, to go through all this stuff by herself, she would have been in trouble. We went through the whole process of, do you want these dolls? She didn't want the dolls, and I don't know what to do with these dolls, but what was getting in the way was the emotional <coughs> irritation at her mother for getting the, buying these stupid dolls in the first place. She started collecting dolls from TV station, mm -hmm. and so the dolls would come in in the boxes. She had like 40, 50 of them, and they never came out of the boxes, but they're all stacked up in the closet. And I said, oh, lucky you, they're already in the boxes. That's less work for you. But we I had to move her from resentment to let's just take care of it. <laughs> you see, the attitude's really important. Once we shifted her in attitude, she was much more willing to show up. And once she realized that there was no way out, that it was really her responsibility, she stayed with the question. Part of the reason why people don't answer this is because they resent having to answer it in the first place. It's not like they don't, can't figure it out, it's that they don't want to be there. There were a lot of dolls. There were broken dolls, and then a few valuable dolls, and then there were the dolls that she had bought from the TV that were still in their boxes. So we started with the broken dolls. What would you do with a broken doll? Not just a doll, um, like 28, dolls from that were 50 or 60 years old swap the parts what swap the parts swap the parts it's like very time consuming <laughs> actually she didn't want to put them out on the street because she felt like she was putting her mother out on the street okay she had her mother and the dolls connected and she was even mad at her put the mother, so I thought she'd want to put the dolls out on the street. It didn't work out that way. So I happened to be at dinner. What happened is the people hire me to help them figure this out, and I just happened to say, I happen to know somebody who makes uh, sculptures out of this kind of thing. And I emailed her, she said, yeah, I'd love to have them. They were gone. Then in another house, we went through two large containers of stuffed animals and beanie babies. The children are now 20, late 20s, but the mother was holding on to them and she wanted to go through each one and, and decide which ones to keep. Okay, that's her right and her privilege, if that's how, how she wants there? to spend her time. What? How many were there? Like oh, hundreds, hundreds. There was like two containers this big. Wow. It's her right and privilege to go through them. It was sentimental attachment to her children. And I said, you know, there's a couple ways we could do this, like you, you know, you, you your time is valuable, and, and she said, no, I really, want to, I really want to go through them. So that it's her process of letting go, and that needs to be respected. There's no one way of doing this. You're not in a hurry. You want to do it with honor and respect. So she, we did. We spilled them out, sorted them out, spread them out, and she picked about seven of them. The rest went back in the containers. What do you do with all those? In this country, it's very hard to get rid of stuffed animals because of all the dirt and everything, dust. You have to wash them. Then you can give them yeah, and then who's really going to wash them? So the whole idea is so you can take it to Savers, by the way. Savers will take anything. What is Savers? Savers is it's a, thrift shop. a thrift shop, a very large thrift shop. And then they sell things to make money to do nonprofit good. One? There's one in Framingham. There's one in Lowell. Marlboro. Okay. I know epilepsy fund tell me when they collect things. Yeah, epilepsy sell, will take them to Savers. Right, there's a whole world that wants to help you out. You just stay connected. So I, I happened to be at dinner and I asked the person, I said, do you know what, I have all these stuffed animals, what would you do with them? She said, I'll take them. And I went, you're kidding, what are you going to do with them? She does um, recovery counseling. Mm -hmm. And the stuffed animals are part of the therapy. And she picked them up. To, I brought them out of the house. They go into my garage. She picks up the garage and they're gone. You see, there's an answer for it all. So I just want to reassure you, if you stay with the question, the answer is right around the corner. 
If you stay connected to people, the answer's right around the corner. Ask three people, what would you do if you were me? And then the dialogue happens and it's a lovely experience. <laughs>